the last talk for tonight uh, is Dr. Annie Verghese. She is uh, with us here on the panelists also, and she's going to talk about EECP for the treatment of heart failure. Uh, Dr. Annie is a medical director of advanced medical, uh, advanced cardiovascular care in uh, Houston, Texas. Annie? All right, I'm just setting up the slides there. We're gonna share the screen. And what a pleasure and an honor to be here, Dr. Halleck and Dr. Crazier. Um, let's see, gonna start from the beginning. Delighted to have you. There we go. All right, great. Thank you. I am so passionate um, about an external uh, counterpulsation and I love to talk about it around the world. So, um, I only have eight minutes, so here we go. Uh, target population for external counter, uh, external counter pulsation is actually coronary artery disease patients with angina, refractory to medical therapy. We know that NCD guidelines in the United States uh, for Medicare cover that, but also congestive heart failure patients can benefit from this. And many of the insurance companies in Medicare do cover for heart failure patients. Um, patients with disabling angina pectoris who in the opinion of their cardiologists or cardiac surgeons are not readily amenable to invasive procedures because they're inoperable or at high risk um, of operative complications. Their coronary anatomy is not readily accessible to such procedures or they have other comorbid states. So heart failure definitely comes into play in this. But the most exciting thing that I wanna talk about here is ECP in COVID-19 heart failure. So there are several publications, uh, one in the European Journal of Heart Failure in August of 2020, talking about patients with COVID-19 having a significant incidence of acute heart failure associated with very high mortality rates. And those uh, patients with a history of heart failure are prone to developing acute decompensated uh, heart failure after COVID-19 diagnosis. And I had several patients like this who actually became much more ill after the COVID-19 diagnosis. We see that we have ARDS and pulmonary hypertension, right heart failure developing, and this sympathetic activation increase that many of our speakers have talked about, increased uh, the RAS, uh, volume overload, stress cardiomyopathy, LV dysfunction, and heart failure. And as Dr. Crazier was talking about the renal impairment causing this volume overload and the septic shock patients that many of our speakers talked about even using ECMO uh, because of LV dysfunction in the COVID-19 heart failure patients. So all of our talks have kind of touched on this and, and because of this pandemic, we all are so faced with this terrible uh, effect of COVID-19 on heart failure patients and causing heart failure. The inflammatory mediators, um, are very important, as Dr. Perrin talked about, causing this myocardial depression. And we see direct cardiac injury, myocarditis, uh, thrombotic activation, ischemia, and uh, also increased metabolic demand causing ischemia. Um, they, all of these pathways are leading to heart failure. So we have a whole new set of patients that uh, need our help with regard to heart failure treatment. And the goals of the treatment is to optimize preload and afterload, inotropic support, mechanical circulatory support, all of these, these things that we've talked about. The heart failure patients show significantly worsening uh, clinical presentation and they have a higher all-cause mortality. And Ray and Associates discussed that perhaps these patients are less frequently admitted to ICU, less often receiving mechanical ventilation. And that paradox illustrates the difficulties of allocating medical resources during such a pandemic. I have seen my patients waiting uh, for ICU transfer and, uh, and some of them have had to um, you know, have terrible catastrophe in the institution where they were um, because they could not get to a higher level of care. So a significant number of heart failure patients with advanced age comorbidities may have limited access uh, to critical care units. So that may be one of the causes of this uh, pandemic within a pandemic, I would say. Uh, and even if severe presentations of COVID-19 may require the temporary reduction or withdrawal of ACE and ARB uh, or, or other um, uh, medical therapy as a result of hemodynamic or renal deterioration. So a lot of these patients are getting off of their medications. And I actually had a patient who went home uh, from another facility and all of his medications were stopped. So we must restore this, uh, uh, this medical therapy, guideline-driven medical therapy that's been proven to impact uh, the course of heart failure. So in that introduction, I wanna talk about uh, beyond that is the external counter pulsation. How does this work? We wanna increase the coronary blood flow in diastole, easy procedure, 
is um, a series of three cuffs wrapped around the calves, lower thighs, upper thighs, and buttocks, sequentially compressing upon diastole, improving the coronary flow, increasing venous resistance, and systolic unloading, increasing cardiac output up to 25%. And many of you may never have heard about external uh, counterpulsation or enhanced external counterpulsation, but the regimen is 35 hours. Uh, the benefit is seen um, 10 to 14 days in treatment. So some of the studies have shown even just two weeks of therapy have benefited. I was uh, just uh, telling Dr. Halleck that uh, one of my patients, who's my uncle actually from Oregon, increased his ejection fraction from 15% to 30% after six weeks of therapy. So I'm very excited about external counterpulsation. But beyond me, from the 1950s, the Cantoritz brothers, Sarnoff, Bitwell, Gorlin, all of these great investigators showed improvement in um, ejection fraction, uh, ischemia, um, uh, in multiple clinical trials throughout the years. And, in, and it kind of fell off uh, favor in the 1970s. People were not able to use this hydraulic external counterpulsation mechanism. It was kind of archaic. Uh, but uh, that in the 80s, China and uh, Saroff, uh, investigators there redeveloped the technology and created a pneumatic system, which we use today. So there were several, several clinical trials uh, in uh, 92 in SUNY, the Stony Brook uh, trial, Used 18, showed in 18 patients with chronic angina, refractory to medical therapy, and showed um, the benefit that all patients reported improvement in anginal symptoms. So um, after Stony Brook, um, there were uh, other clinical trials. Um, this is in Stony Brook, how the effect of ECP treatment on exercise-induced uh, radionuclide defects improved in those patients, um, resolving those defects. Now, there was a MUST trial, MUST EECP trial, which showed reduction in time to ST segment depression and episodes of angina with improved long term quality of life. And you can see that here in this graphic right there, showing the exercise duration improved and time to ST depression also improved in those patients. So um, ECP increased the time to exercise induced ST segment depression, decreased the frequency of angina episodes. And um, beyond that, we can look at the international ECP patient registry. And in this, in this registry, this is what I want you to pay attention to, that these were heart failure patients. They had functional class three or four disease and uh, Canadian class three or four and New York Heart Association, New York Heart Association class uh, two and three and had multiple uh, vessel disease, prior cabbage. And you can see here that with that treatment, these patients were be able to move from class three and four down to class one and two. And that's huge. I mean, if you don't remember anything else in my talk, remember this slide because ECP can decrease angina and help heart failure patients. Now, Saran and Associates showed improved exercise tolerance, quality of life after <laughs> ECP for patients with class two and three heart failure. Mike's in exercise capacity. Um, so uh, Dr. Feldman, uh, one of my good friends, showed that uh, ECP improved exercise tolerance in patients with chronic heart failure. So in my clinic here in Dubai, I'm, I'm doing a CPET uh, um, analysis. So, it, it, you know, exercise um, with the MVO2 um, measurement. And uh, similarly, they were looking at that, uh, the tolerance of exercise with chronic heart failure patients, excuse me, heart failure patients in ECP. I'm trying to speak fast so I can get done. Uh, so we honor your time. 35% uh, of subjects in the ECP group and 25% of the control subjects increased exercise time by at least 60 seconds. So we see that ECP benefits the heart failure patient as well as the angina patients. So it's a safe, effective treatment for angina factors refractory to medical therapy. And the benefits of ECP include an improvement of functional status in more than 70% of patients. And the benefits are both short-term and long-term, as I told you about my uncle there in Oregon. Now, let's talk about endothelial dysfunction because I want to take it home with COVID-19 and endothelial dysfunction. It's a key early event in atherogenesis. And um, endothelial dysfunction is seen in coronary artery disease, as we can see here in this slide. But also in COVID-19, it plays a very important uh, role here. Nitric oxide is highly important with regard to COVID-19. COVID-19 begins with an acute respiratory distress, moves to all the vascular networks. 
And you see this platelet endothelial dysfunction and rapid life-threatening blood clotting. So SARS-CoV-2 is a thrombotic vascular disease. I tell patients this is a cardiovascular disease. It's not a pulmonary disease. Targeting endothelial cells, particularly evident in patients with cardiometabolic comorbidities, such as hypertension and endothelial dysfunction, just as we saw in the early days of COVID-19, when we weren't sure what was happening. Hallmark of endothelial dysfunction and thrombosis is suppressed endothelial nitric oxide synthase, or enos and subsequent nitric oxide deficiency. So nitric oxide interferes with the interaction between coronavirus, the viral S protein, and its host receptor ACE2, so critical to prevent viral cellular entry. ECP can be a consideration for prevention and early treatment of endothelial dysfunction in the COVID-19 patient uh, beyond our heart failure patients in general. Mechanism of action is that of increasing nitric oxide production. So there are two levels of benefit, the reverse platelet endothelial dysfunction and associated thrombosis and lowering the viral burden. We're gonna see a little cartoon there in, in just a second. Uh, Ryan and uh, associates showed that uh, SARS-CoV-2 mediated endothelial dysfunction is the potential role of chronic oxidative stress. And we, we know about endothelial cells playing a key role in SARS-CoV-2 infection and inflammatory pathologies, just like I said, thrombosis, atherosclerosis, lung injury, and the mitochondria regulate the inflammatory pathways via the redox signaling. So through uh, mitochondrial R uh, ROS, causing oxidative stress that initiates and exacerbates senescence or inflammation, chronic endothelial dysfunction, activating the feedback loops that perpetuate mitochondrial dysfunction. And this, uh, this cartoon here nicely shows pulsatile shear stress as a backstop for COVID-19. So giving here the reasonings for using external counterpulsation it, external counterpulsation provides a similar benefit as this gentle jogger model shown in this cartoon here, where we see the dichrotic notch for each aortic pulse wave improves with adding pulsations. And this is the same way that EECP works. And this was shown by Marvin and associates uh, regarding the benefit of endothelial pulsatile shear stress in the COVID-19 patients. So we see increased production of adrenomedulin, activating G protein receptor, activating protein kinase A, activating ENOS, and uh, then you have increased endothelial-derived nitric oxide. So endothelial pulsatile shear stress uh, is important for increasing prostacycline, TPA, superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, which I was going to ask Dr. Perrin about that, catalase, uh, producing an anti-inflammatory endothelium phenotype. Remember, it's all about the inflammation, and we've heard it over and over in this great symposium here tonight. SARS-CoV-2 activates the endothelium. The endothelium monolayer loses its barrier function, and we see increased permeability. And reactive oxygen species, uh, peroxynitrates, and NADPH are produced. Endothelial, endothelial cell manifests procoagulant phenotype. So we are causing uh, this um, hyperthrombotic state in multiple levels. And we can see interleukin-6 and interleukin-1, very important, just as Dr. Crazier talked about in his uh, discussion. So PSS is a means to widely distribute beneficial endothelial-derived mediators. I'm almost done. So ECP doubles the number of pulses in the circulation. So producing this pulsatile shear stress, and that's what we need to increase uh, the nitric oxide production. We can prevent viral replication, uh, involved in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, endothelial dysfunction, all of the benefits shown there. So the take-home messages um, on my last slide is enhanced external counterpulsation is a valuable therapeutic alternative for patients with coronary disease, refractive angina, heart failure. 80% of patients who undergo ECP therapy have a positive clinical response. And this is associated with immediate increase in blood flow in various vascular blood beds, including the coronary arteries. So increasing blood flow translates into enhanced vascular shear stress. And that's a stimulus for endothelial production, releasing nitric oxide, key factor in endothelial homeostasis, and very important in the COVID-19 patient. Thank you very much. Annie, thank you so much for this excellent talk, as, as usual, and very exciting uh, and new findings, especially the COVID and uh, EECP. Uh, we're going to start a question, because your talk was the last talk, so maybe I'll start if I can ask you a question about your talk, and then we'll go for other questions. How soon after patient admitted with COVID, 
let's see, have some, I mean, all kind of uh, pulmonary or other uh, issues in addition to heart failure. Do you start ECB in that time or do you wait until the patient is more stable? Right, so I have COVID patients. <laughs> patient is not in CCU, patient is like in the floor, yeah. Yes, absolutely. No, no, no. They go home, you know, once we, they have stabilized with all our medical therapy, if they're in the ICU, you know, get all of that done, get them home, and uh, then we start the ECP therapy. So, you know, it may be several weeks out, um, even two weeks would be okay. They just need to be COVID negative. You can bring them into the clinic. Okay, great. So because I just want to be sure it's not really acute treatment, it's this chronic right. treatment right. after because patient the, discharge yes, and right. stable. Right, the effects are chronic. We're we're looking at the long hauler post COVID syndrome, right? So this right, is one right, of the yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So I'll start with uh, Doctor Annie because that's the last memory uh, with us. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for ECP, um, we looked into another device called Gecko. Have you heard of this? A peroneal a peripheral uh, neuromuscular stimulator, a Gecko device? I don't know of it. I think I've heard of it, uh, something yeah, similar. It's a small device that, uh, again, topical or percutaneous, you can, uh, it stimulates the peroneal nerve and you can um, think theoretically that it improves the blood flow. So we, um, once I was in Western in Canada, we did a study where we um, implied this device and made the coronary flow and it does improve. So that's why you have a good business in future in Dubai because we will be having refractory angina patients and those we are not able to treat and we're going to send it to you for EECP. And we do have many patients, they don't like stents and it's better for them to get or go ahead with your EECP. I have found that around the world, people, even though they love the Dr. Craziers of the world and the Texas Heart Institutes of the world, you know, there are people who um, they don't want any intervention. So I think it's great that this conference showcases everything, you know, from uh, the heart transplant, you know, all the way down to ECP. So thank you again for allowing me to present. Yeah, Omar, thank you very much for your friendship, for your partnership, uh, for uh really uh, moving forward with this concept uh, and being persistent even at the time of COVID. And uh, it was a pleasure once again to work with you on this uh, project. And thank you, Annie, and all the uh, other participants, uh, all the faculty and panelists. Uh, we are very pleased that uh, this was another successful event uh, or four T's. Uh, so we will be in touch and we'll see you in the future. Thank you. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Inshallah. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank Good you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.